I'm going to talk about uh, some joint work with Kristen Hendricks, Jen Hong, and Matt Stahlfragen, uh, to where we proved a mapping cone formula for involute Hager flare homology. So we'll talk about that. Um, let's see. Oops. Okay, here we go. So just um, a little bit of background. Uh, Higgard flow homology. Many of us know and know the basics of this. Um, Jen talked about this, um, and Matt talked about it too yesterday. But we'll give a little bit of background. Um, so if I have a three manifold uh, equipped with a spin C structure, there are these modules over a polynomial ring called HF minus, HF plus, and HF infinity, defined by Ojvat and Zabo. Um, a spin C structure, if you don't know what that is, you can just think of it as a class, a cohomology class in H upper two. It's kind of um, sufficient for understanding roughly what it is. Um, with some algebraic topological input. Um, uh, and there's a refinement for knots, which we've had several talks on and many people are familiar with. Um, if you have a knot in a integer homology three sphere, then there's this, uh, there's a version of not of, of Hagard flare homology with extra structure associated to the knot, which basically amounts to, um, there's a couple ways to encode it. One way is as a Z plus Z filtration. Jen Hom talked about another way to encode it, which is as a complex over a two variable polynomial ring. Uh, but basically it's just Hagard flare homology with some extra, just some extra structure, um, which we're gonna take as a filtration over Z plus Z. Uh, so here's the trefoil, um, here's an example. Um, and so we wanna just kind of think of all the generators as living, as being, I, you know, having a distinguished point of the plane associated to them, which corresponds to their filtration level. Okay. Um, and so jumping into sort of uh, a really important theorem uh, for computations, a really useful theorem is Oshwath and Zabo's mapping cone formula. Uh, which says, um, I'll explain what these terms mean, but it says that if you do surgery on a knot, then there's a way to compute the Hagard flur homology. Um, and it's in terms of a mapping cone. We'll, we'll explain what the terms are. But basically, you can use knot flur homology and write down and kind of rearrange pieces of knot flur homology to get what we call a mapping cone formula. Um, and uh, just it's here, if there's experts who know about this, I'm going to work over the minus version. So technically, you need to do these completed coefficients over the power series ring instead of just the polynomial ring. Um, and one of the most important things about this mapping cone formula is that if you have a knot in S3, then this whole mapping cone is determined entirely by the knot flur complex. And in a lot of cases that can be just computed by hand. Um, and there's a lot of tools for doing computations. And so if you know the knot flare complex, then this mapping cone formula for knots in S3 will tell you what the Haggard flare complexes of a surgery are. Um, I'll talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what these terms are, A, a B, and D sub N, the mapping cone differentials. Um, so this bold A, it's a direct product of Z complexes and this uh, blackboard bold B is also a direct product. Um, and, and I'm going to tell you what these A sub S and B sub S are. Uh, they have a simple description in terms of the filtration. I'll just give you like many people know this, um, but I'll give you a little flavor of what these complexes look like. Um, so B sub S is actually just the underlying complex of the three manifold or it's homotopy equivalent to that. Um, that's one comment. And so here's a kind of a picture of what you want to think of them as. So A sub S, remember that C of K infinity has this Z plus Z filtration. So A sub S is kind of a quadrant um, and it depends on S, like S tells you the level to cut the quadrant at. And uh, B sub S is a half plane. So actually B sub S doesn't change as S changes, but A sub S does. And so there are these two, you know, for every S we have one of these complexes and the bold S, the blackboard bold, sorry, the blackboard bold A is like the direct product. Um, and so here's in words what this is. It's a subcomplex of C of K infinity spanned by the generators in that quadrant. And B sub S here's in words, just what I said. It's, uh, sorry, the IJ axis. So um, 
B sub S is the, the subcomplex of C of K infinity spanned by generators in the half plane, I J less than or equal to, with I less than or equal to zero. Um, okay, and so one important thing is that there's a, a sub, AS is a subcomplex of B sub S, that's kind of obvious. So there's an inclusion map. Like, you know, if you have a subcomplex, you can make that a functorial by saying there's a map from one to the other, which is the inclusion map. Okay, and so here's what the differential in the mapping cone looks like. So the differential d sub n is a sum of two maps. So v sub n, v is the inclusion of a s to b s. And there's another map h, which sends a s to b sub s plus n, n is the surgery coefficient. OK, so v is the inclusion. Um, h is a little more complicated to describe. Um, it's a composition of two things. Um, here I have a picture. So a sub s is the inclusion Sorry, H is the inclusion of A sub S into kind of the other half plane, which contains A sub S, right? A sub S is a quadrant, so it's kind of contained in two half planes. B sub S is one of the half planes, but I'm going to call B tilde sub S the other half plane that contains it. So H is a composition of two maps. It's a composition of the inclusion map into this other half plane, B sub S tilde, followed by some homotopy equivalence between B tilde S and B sub S plus N, which you know exists for some abstract reason. Like if you look, if you know, understand what the complexes represent, there's kind of a, you know that these two, these two half planes are, the complexes associated are homotopy equivalent. So H is a composition of these two maps. Um, and so here's a kind of picture of what happens. Like we have A and B are direct products. And so V kind of preserves the index and H kind of, increases it by one. Let's say the surgery coefficient, oops, it's not what I wanted. Surgery coefficient is, is one. So um, here's kind of a schematic of it. Um, and so kind of the, the thing is for, the really important thing is that for knots in S3, the homotopy type of this mapping cone is just completely determined by the, hom the homotopy type of the complex C of K infinity as a, you know, in the appropriate category of by filtered complexes. Um, and if you remember what I just said, like the only ambiguity, there's just one ambiguity in this and that's the homotopy equivalence. But if you think carefully about what these complexes actually are, um, the homotopy, they're both B tilde and B are both homotopy equivalent to just the ordinary Higgard floor complex of S3, which is F adjoined U. So, you know, if you have two, chain complexes, um, and they're both homotopy equivalent to F adjoin U, then actually there's a unique homotopy equivalence between them up to chain homotopy. Um, and that's kind of a basic observation, but it's really useful for, for practical purposes. You kind of, you leverage it a lot when doing the mapping cone formula. You can just pick whatever homotopy equivalence you like, and that's kind of sufficient. Um, okay, so that's, that's the mapping cone formula of Oshoff and Zabo. Um, and we're going to talk about involutive Higgard floor homology and how to define an involutive version of this. Um, so we've, we've heard a bit from Jen's talk on involutive Higgard floor homology already, but I'm going to do a bit of review. So suppose that we have a three manifold, which now has a self-conjugate spin C structure. So self there's a conjugation action on the set of spin C structures. Um, and I just want one that's fixed, a spin C structure that's fixed by, by um, this action. So, you know, usually people kind of conflate self-conjugate spin C structures with spin structures. And if you, if you want, you can just say, I'm going to pick a spin structure on the, the three manifold instead of a spin C structure. Um, that's perfectly safe to do. Um, so Hendricks and Manolescu, they study this homotopy involution, iota, um, which whenever you have a self-conjugate spin C structure, you have this, this sort of involution homotopy, it squares to the identity up to homotopy. And it's, as a map, it's well-defined up to homotopy. How is it defined? Well, what you do is you take your Hagard splitting, sigma alpha beta, which I'm not going to tell you what that is, but so if you, um, it's, uh, and what you do is you take it, it's an oriented surface 
sigma is oriented, and you have these you have the alpha side and the beta side. Sigma splits y into two handle bodies. And like you want to just change how the data is arranged in the Hager splitting. So what you do is you take the splitting and you just change the orientation of sigma and you change the order of the alphas and betas. But like morally, it's the same Hager splitting. You've just flipped around the data, like changed the indices, basically. Um, and there's a canonical involution, chain, chain isomorphism between the Hager Fleur homology, the chain complex of H and the chain complex of H bar. There's a canonical one. It's just you take one intersection point on one diagram and you map it to the intersection point on the other diagram. Um, so that's a chain isomorphism. But what you can do is you can then take this, you can compose with the sort of map from naturality that sends H, the chain complex for H to the chain complex for H bar. The map from naturality is gotten by picking a sequence of stabilizations and handle slides and kind of moves of the alpha and beta curves, isotopies and handle slides, um, and then stabilizations or destabilizations to move from one to the other. Um, and so um, if you compose these two maps, you get an endomorphism of just the hager fleur complex itself. And that's the involution. And um, what do you do with it? Well, Hendricks and Manolescu define the involutive hager fleur homology as the mapping cone of one, the identity plus the involution. And they, they kind of add in this formal Q variable, which is just notation, basically. Um, and they do that because you can, if you add in this Q variable, for, sort of formally, you can view this as a module over F join U mod Q squared. And um, you know, the Q action just kind of maps the domain part of the mapping cone to the codomain via the formal, you know, just send it an intersection point there, or sorry, generator in the domain to the generator in the codomain. Um, and so that's like a nice way to package. It. It's kind of a natural way to package the um, the uh, uh, the involutive Hager flow homology to define a chain complex. Um, and so this is a lot of this has had a lot of recent applications to the homology cobordism group. Sort of one nice application was that recently, well, sort of recently, a few years ago. Um, Dai Homstoff, Reagan, and Trong used it to prove that there was a z-infinity sum and of the homology, the integer homology cobordism group. Um, so that's one application, but there have been a, a number of good, of nice applications of involutive Hager floor homology. Um, and so just kind of a general question is how do we do computations? Usually for applications to the homology cobordism group, you really need to do computations kind of analogous to what um, Jen was talking about, like to do for a lot of theorems, you you know, actually doing computations can be quite challenging, but it's something that's very important for, um, you know, for a lot of applications. Um, and uh, we, we kind of have an analogous question that to the one that Jen was considering, but for the volume of Hager floor homology instead of volume of not floor homology. Um, and so kind of I'm leading into this, but it, you know, one example of a, very natural thing you might ask for studying the involute the uh, um, the homology cobordism group is, is is whether there's a version of the mapping cone formula for involutive Hager fleur homology. So I'll just kind of summarize some previous results um, towards computations um, that allow for computations. Uh, I'll remind you from, from Jen's talk that Hendricks and Manolescu defined a not involution, which is kind of like, uh, is if you have a, a, let's say a not in S3, there's, uh, there's an endomorphism. It actually no longer is really even a homotopy involution. It, as you might have, if you were paying attention to Jen's talk or if you're familiar with it, it actually squares to the Sharkar map. Um, and so, you know, over, F over the field with two elements, I, I guess iota case to the fourth power is homotopic to the identity, but it, it's not as natural, but we call it an involution, even though it doesn't, it's kind of, uh, the convention is to call it an involution, even though it's not technically an involution, but morally it's the, plays the role of involution. 
Um, and so here's a computational technique or a computational result, the, one of the first ones in oops, Hendricks and Manolesco's original paper um, that lets one do a lot of computations. It says that uh, it's a large surgery formula. It says that if you have the surgery coefficient and you let it get sufficiently large, then you can compute the, um, well, you can compute the involution on CF minus of the surgery in the zero spin C structure on the sur surgery in terms of um, the not involution uh, on A0. So I'll remind you that A0 is the subcomplex of CFK, is a subcomplex of CFK infinity. It actually sort of featured in the mapping cone formula we already talked a little bit, but it basically corresponds to like the symmetric quadrant of the, the subcomplex in a symmetric kind of a quadrant of the, um, in the plane, uh, all the generated by the generators in that quadrant. Um, and so kind of formally, you, if you know the not involution, then you know the volume of Higgard floor homology of surgeries, of large surgeries. Um, so, I mean, you can write down specifically what N has to be, but um, that's, you know, in, uh, um, a priori just is sufficiently large. So there's kind of a concrete number, a uh, lower bound for it that you need. Um, and so in particular, just kind of rewriting this, you can compute the involute of Higgard floor homology of the surgery that the complex or the homology group, it's the mapping cone of this, of A0 with one, uh, the identity plus iota k. Um, and if, if you're not as familiar with all the spin C structure conventions, kind of zero in brackets, I'm using that, there, there's a canonical identification of the spin C structures on the N surgery of Y with, um, Z mod N and I'm using kind of the zero one there. There's a canonical, there's kind of a simple description of them and zero is, zero is a canonical one under this identification. Um, one challenge to using this for applications is that, you know, you need the surgery coefficient to be large. And if you want to study the homology cohortism group you probably want to do like plus one surgery on a knot and usually plus one surgery won't be a large surgery. So that's a sort of limitation for the homology cohorts for studying the homology cohortism group. Um, another computational technique is that Hendricks and Lipschitz computed the hat version of involute of Hager Fleur homology combinatorially using ordered Fleur homology of uh, Lipschitz, Oshvap and Thurston. Um, and uh, they also proved an exact sequence. Uh, they proved that uh, kind of what you might expect from ordinary Higgard Fleur homology, they proved that, but only on the hat version. So the hat version is where you set u equal to zero. So you kind of lose some information, but they proved that using border. Um, another really useful result for computations is um, a theorem of Dye and Manolescu, where they computed in volume of Higgard Fleur homology for three manifolds obtained by plumbing along almost rational graphs. Um, and this includes all cipher fibered homology three spheres. So a lot of, a lot of three manifolds, but not, every, I mean, it gives you a lot, um, but not everything. And it's, uh, there's still, it still is helpful to have the mapping cone formula in general. Um, some more computational techniques. There's a, a, a Kunith theorem, a Kunith formula, for taking tensor products. Uh, actually, the involution on the tensor product turns out to just be the tensor product of the involutions. Um, that was proven by Hendricks, Manolescu, and myself. Um, and then I kind of, uh, I, there's a version of this for not fluoromology that Jen Hom mentioned in her talk uh, that there's a formula for it. If you just take, if you know the involutions on K1 and K2, there's a formula for the involution on the tensor product or on the connected sum. Um, it's not, it's no longer just the tensor product of the involutions, but it's, it's almost that it's sort of that plus a correction term. Um, but that allows computations that's helpful if you want to compute tensor products of things or connected sums of things. Um, okay, so the, now we're kind of, we're gonna talk about the new developments, kind of the theorems for this talk. Um, and so the first thing that we're going to talk about are exact sequences. So Hendrick, Sam, Stop, Reagan, and myself, we've proven uh, 
a lot of the exact sequences that you would want to know. Um, we proved that if you have a framed knot in a three manifold, then there's an exact sequence. Um, y sub zero just denotes the surgery with respect to the framing and um, Y one is sort of, um, it doesn't have to be the zero framing of a null homologous knot. Uh, you just increment the surgery coefficient by one. Um, we proved that. And then also there's kind of, if you have a knot in an integer homology three sphere, there's sort of as another version of the exact sequence, which you might expect from Hager Fleur homology. Um, that involves uh, incrementing the surgery coefficient by M instead of just N. And it also appears, there also appears sort of a twisted version of not floor homology, or, sorry, twisted version of HFI. Um, that's kind of what you would expect if you're familiar with the exact sequences and the surgery theorems from ordinary Hager floor homology. Um, uh, with that latter one, does the involution, uh, is it sort of the identity on the twisted coefficient system when you sort of, uh, I realize the isomorphism, you know, with, you know, the... That's a great question. Actually, it's not the identity. It kind of, um, it's going to shift the surgery coefficient, kind of the, I can tell you what it does in the, if you take the S, B sub S, it'll send it to B sub minus S plus N. So uh, I'll draw a picture. It'll be a okay. picture. Yeah, that, yeah, okay, thanks. But um, it'll, it, it, it'll change that, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, okay, so, and then we use this, we leverage this at kind of following the standard procedure that many people have, uh, I mean, kind of this is a robust technique of Ojvath and Zabo to prove a version of the mapping cone formula by starting with the exact sequence and then uh, moving to sort of the mapping cone formula. Um, so there's, uh, so we first kind of, we proved sort of a weak version at first, which just um, says that if you have a knot in just any integer homology three sphere, then there's some diagram or there's some, there's some maps, HN and DN and um, IOTA A and B, which um, give you a homotopy equivalence between the involutive Hager fleur homology of the surgery and some square. Um, like this. And the reason it's a square now is because involutive Hager fleur homology is already a mapping cone. So it's kind of a mapping cone of cones, and that's like a square diagram with a diagonal arrow in it. Um, that's not, this theorem's not super useful for computations in its current state because this is just saying that there are some maps which make this, uh, which give you a homotopy equivalence, but it doesn't tell you anything about what the maps are. And for instance, the homotopy H sub N, if you change that map, it might change the homotopy type of the mapping cone a lot. It's easy to just, you just add in any chain map of the appropriate grading that could definitely change what the cone, the homotopy type is. So you need a stronger version of the cone. Um, so yeah, what just appeared here is just what I just said. So um, there's sort of a strong version which I'll tell you, which does allow for computations for knots in S3. Um, so this is the key, prop the key properties that distinguish the strong version of it are, are as follows. Um, if you take the differential, well, it decomposes as a sum. Um, and the key, so the V term is an inclusion map. And the H term, just as in Oshvath and Zabo's mapping cone, it factors through another inclusion map. And that, that's important. Um, and now the homotopy type, or sorry, the homotopy H sub N, the key property that we want for computations is that this map also factors through an inclusion map. Um, it factors through the inclusion map into this sort of one of the other half planes followed by a homotopy equivalence. Or sorry, yeah, followed by, well, actually just some map is the homotopy. So it factors as the inclusion followed by just some map. But the key thing is that all the maps in the cone, they all initially factor through an inclusion map into one of the B complexes. Um, and then here's some properties of the involutions or the IOTA A terms. Uh, well, it, IOTA A is determined by just the not involution up to some shift. Um, that's the U to the S term is just some kind of formal shift. Um, and it sends A sub S to A sub minus S. Um, and iota B is the composition of this term, U 
to the s iota k, which sends b sub s to tilde b sub minus s. It sends, um, so it's basically something determined by iota k, followed by um, a homotopy equivalence from uh, b tilde minus s to b sub minus s plus n. So in particular, it sends a sub s to b sub minus s plus n. Um, and kind of the most important thing that we prove for computations is that all of these properties just uniquely determine the mapping cone up to homotopy. So in particular, like all you need to know is iota k and that'll determine this, the, the mapping, that'll determine the um, homotopy type of the mapping cone, of the involutive mapping cone. Um, uh, that's what I just, and so this is what I just said. Yeah, the mapping cone is completely determined by, um, and it is relatively easily computed from just the not involution. Um, and there's, we also proved the sort of rational surgeries version and zero surgeries version, which are, are things that Oshvath and Zabo proved in their, for their, for the ordinary mapping cone formula. We proved them here as well. Um, um, yeah. Do you have a, uh, I mean, is this, does your strong version hold for, for L spaces, more generally knots in L spaces, or at least the Poincaré sphere? Yeah, anything, anytime. So uh, yeah, anytime, I guess, uh, like, I guess we proved it when, yeah, just L spaces, yeah. Okay. And not in an L space, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so here's, I'm, uh, we'll talk, I'll say, I guess I have a, something on that in a slide or two, but um, I mean, that's how the rational surgeries version is proven anyway. So yeah, that's how we, we did it. The way you, you, you might expect is you prove it for rational, uh, sorry, you prove it for rationally null homologous knots in, a, in an L space. And that's kind of what the key to proving it for rational surgeries on knots in S3. It's just like as in Ojvath and Zabo's original proof. Um, and so here's, okay, so returning to our example, we can kind of get a schematic of what the involution looks like. Uh, so here's D1, here's the, sorry, let's look at the one surgery, the plus one surgery on a knot. So here's the mapping cone complex of Ojvath and Zabo. This is just the ordinary one with no involution. And I can tell you what the involution looks like or what a model of it looks like. Um, and so here, here's kind of what it looks like schematically. So the only thing is on the bottom, we kind of reverse the orders of the Bs. So they kind of are now decreasing indices, whereas on the top, they're increasing indices as you go left to right. But you get a sense of what happens. Like iota A is gonna switch A sub S and A sub minus S and iota B, it kind of is the symmet picture that's symmetric in the plane. Um, if you put things down like this, it has that. And then the homotopy goes from A sub minus S to A sub S, I guess. Um, and so that's kind of a schematic of what it looks like. Um, and so there's kind of just an algebraic content of this, of this theorem um, that we proved, which, which there's kind of a, uh, there's just a purely algebraic version of this, um, which you can just phrase in terms of iota complexes and iota k complexes. So if you have an, um, if you have a, so what is an iota complex? Um, well, an iota complex, I guess I didn't, write a formal definition, but an iota complex is kind of just an algebraic abstraction of a the of involutive Hagrid Fleur homology. It's a free chain complex over F adjoin U with a homotopy involution. And you want it to sort of have the homology that looks like it's of an uh, uh, integer homology three sphere. So, um, and then an iota k complex is the algebraic abstraction of like a complex with a knot involution, like CFK infinity of a knot involution. We, it's just, you write down all the formal properties satisfied by those and that's an iota k complex. Um, and you can look at, these kind of have their own categories and you can look at, um, you can look at them. And one natural question is how do you go from an iota k complex to an iota complex? Um, is there just some, because well, that's kind of what the mapping cone is doing. It's taking an iota k complex and it's fitting out an iota complex. Um, and what you want is just also a purely algebraic version of this. Um, and so there's kind of as, uh, there's, if you have a, a very common situation or a very simple situation um, that we can say something about is if you have an iota k complex where it kind of what you would call B sub S if this is homotopy equivalent to F adjoin U, 
um, if the homology is, has no torsion in it and it's just one F adjoint U tower. Um, so that's kind of a, this, so any knot in an L space will have that. Let's say any null homologous knot in an L space will have this property. Um, yeah, and we call it, it's called an L, we call it L space type because if you had, if it actually came from a knot, then it's L space type if and only if it's a knot in an L space, if and only if the three manifolds in L space. Um, and so kind of the algebraic input of this is just that there's this well-defined algebraic map, which sends this sort of algebraic model of the mapping cone, just to, and we call it the, the algebraic involutive mapping cone, which sends an iota K complex of L space type to an iota complex. And these are sort of well-defined in the homotope, up to homotopy equivalents. Um, and they're also kind of like, it's basically just a functor from the category of iota complexes to iota complex, for, to the category of iota complexes. I mean, that's morally what it is. And that's kind of the right way to think about it. Um, and, and so basically what we've, what we did is we showed that, um, you know, this algebraic sort of model, I mean, this is specified by exactly the properties that we showed um, that the, that the involutive, I mean, this is the, the, the algebraic mapping cone is just exactly the properties that we showed the, uh, um, we're satisfied by knots in S3 or knots in L spaces. Um, then the key thing is this factorization property that like all of the maps in the cube have this nice factorization property where they factor through inclusion maps. And then once you know that everything else is determined, but sort of the most important thing is the factorization. Um, and so we, we've kind of used this to prove several things about the, well, we have one, we have one application to the homology cobordism group. Um, and this builds on the work of um, many authors. And I, I tried to list the, the works that sort of feature most prominently um, towards the computation, but there's Dai Hong, Stoffregen, and Trong, Dai Manalescu, Dai, and Dai Stoffregen. Some people appear multiple times, um, but I'm sort of referring to specific papers. Um, and sort of the application that we, we prove building off of their work is um, that the homology cobordism group is not generated by cypher fiber homology three spheres. Um, why is, in what way is this new? Well, there's a, I mean, there's several proofs. Um, one of Freushov, one of Francesco Lin, and one of Stoff Reagan, which construct classes, which are not cobordant to any homology three sphere, or sorry, where that are not, they're classes in the homology cobordism group, which are not cobordant to any cipher fibered space. Um, but uh, you might wonder whether, well, maybe everything can is coordinate to some linear combination of cipher cipher fibered spaces, um, and that's what we prove is not the case. We show that there's a, there's not um, we we construct a a um, and and of course the we construct a three manifold which isn't coordinate to any linear combination of cipher fibered spaces, and of course the three manifold is plus one surgery on a knot in S three. That's kind of the relevance of the mapping cone formula. Um, and, um, and kind of, you know, one way to phrase the obstruction is that we use the standard complex approach of Dai, Holmes, Stoff, Reagan, and Tron. Um, and that gives an algebraic obstruction to being in the span of cipher fibered spaces. Basically the work of, I mean, several authors, Dai, Manalescu, Dai, and Dai, Stoff, Reagan, showed that anything that's uh, um, a linear combination of cipher fibered spaces has, uh, in a certain sense, as particularly simple Hagard Fleur, involutive Hagard Fleur homology. Um, and so uh, we just exhibited a three manifold, or sorry, a knot where plus one surgery on it is not, uh, doesn't have this simple form and so is not, uh, is not in the span. Um, another, another application that we proved uh, that, that helps with computations is uh, local equivalence classes. Um, so Jen talked a lot about uh, local versions of local equivalence and uh, various notions related to it in her talk. Um, but for I'll just remind remind people um, if we have two iota complexes, so complexes equipped with an involution, um, 
we say they are locally equivalent if there are grading preserving chain maps in both directions, which commute up to homotopy with the involutions, um, and such that F and G become isomorphisms on homology after inverting U. So we want these to kind of preserve the non-torsion elements of homology. Like, you know, the if after we invert U, the homology is just F a joint U, U inverse. It's a it's like the polynomial ring with U inverted. And so we want uh, the induced maps to be isomorphisms on that, but they might interact interestingly with torsion. They might have a big kernel in the torsion part. Um, okay, and basically like the, what you should think is that the local class, the local equivalence class of CF minus Y iota, it contains any, like it just, it's the sort of, contains all the obstructions that you could try to cook up um, from uh, coming from involutive obstructions to homology cohortism coming from involutive Hager and Fleur homology. Um, I mean, as I, it's possible that like you could in, endow involutive Hager and Fleur homology with even more information by, you know, maybe extending it to a pin two thing or pin two object or, or um, using some additional um, input, but on its own, kind of the, the local equivalence class is just completely determining, it, it's sort of the maximal obstruction to homology cohorts and coming from this set of data. Um, and uh, so I'll just remind you of a few things before I state the result we have concerning local equivalence classes, but if we do surgery on a knot, the spin C structures are isomorphic to Z mod N. Um, and the involution on or the conjugation action on spin C structures is just the sort of one you might expect. It's just I maps to minus I. Um, and so if you think about this for a minute, you'll if N is odd, there's only one, which is the zero spin C structure. But if N is even, there's actually two. Um, there's zero and there's N over two. Uh, so there's two spin C structures. So you might ask also, like what can we say anything about the n over two spin c structure? Um, you might recall that Hendricks and Manolescu's large surgery theorem was only about the zero spin c structure. They said basically they couldn't say anything about the n over two spin c structure. So it's kind of an interesting question if there's anything contained, any information contained there. Um, and so, I mean, the mapping cone formula does compute that, but we can say a little bit more about both of these objects. Uh, we, so we prove the following. Um, if we, let's say we do surgery on a knot in S3, integer surgery, um, then we proved um, that the involutive Hager and Fleur homology is locally equivalent to just A0 with the involution. Um, remember that we, you know, we started with the theorem, which was that the involutive Hager Fleur homology was the mapping cone of these of A of this, you know, of these infinite direct products, which is a really big complex if you think about it. On its on its face, the mapping cone theorem, the mapping cone is infinitely generated over F as you and U. Um, you can easily truncate it to say it's finitely generated. Um, as most experts in the mapping cone formula are, are probably familiar with this principle. Um, and that works in this case, you can look at a finite truncation of it, a finite piece, um, but it still is big in general, like the actual complex itself is big. And so what we proved is that it's actually locally equivalent to A0, just the complex width, um, which is just kind of, it's very easy to look at. It just has the same number of generators as CFP infinity. A0 is kind of the, uh, the symmetric quadrant in the plane kind of of, uh, I less than or equal to zero, J less than or equal to zero, is a much smaller model. Um, and then we can also say something about the N over two spin C structure. Um, so here I phrased it, if we did two N surgery on a knot, then kind of the uh, N spin C structure, the complex also has a simple form. It's um, locally equivalent to this, uh, this complex here where we have two copies of A sub N um, and one copy of B sub N, we have a differential, which is the inclusion maps of A sub N into B sub N, um, as well as the internal differentials of A, N, and B, N. Um, and the involution on this complex is now just, you just take the two copies of A sub N and you switch them and you fix B sub N downstairs. 
So there's no input of the not involution on this. It's just kind of this combinatorial thing, I guess. You take a sub n, two copies of a sub n, and you switch them. Um, and so if you're familiar with the mapping cone formula, uh, basically what we sh showed is that the, uh, the local equivalence class is equal to the minimal truncation of the mapping cone formula. If, if you're familiar with the mapping cone formula, that might make sense. If not, basically, this is kind of like the minimal piece that it could possibly be in a natural sense. Uh, that you might expect it to be if you looked at the mapping cone formula. And so that's that's what we showed. We showed that obstructions for homology cobordism can be packaged into a pretty small piece of data. Do you um, have a corresponding uh, kind of statement for the zero surgery? Like, is the zero surgery contain the, the first one that you mentioned as a as a as a local equivalent sum and or something in the way that it is uh, without any um, involutions? Oh, does it? Um, well, the zero surgery doesn't have that many pieces in it. It just has like A0 yeah. and B0 already. It's just a cone of, of um, two maps. Um, you're saying that maybe there's, you could just forget one of them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, maybe, we didn't actually look at that. We, we proved the cone for A0. That's a good question. I, we didn't think about that. I'm just sort of, I mean, comparing this to the sort of corresponding statement that like you have the, the d invariance of one surgery or sort of all surgeries um yeah i guess the d invariant of that spin structure on um all surgeries is kind of determined basically by the zero surgery um oh the zero yeah. surgery um well this is kind of saying that it's controlled by i mean it's sort of similar right like it's saying that um they're all determined i guess it's saying it's they're all determined by the large surgery yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's somehow that's how, yeah. So, one way to go to small is, you know, go to large, pass to zero, and then go to small. I mean, that was, you know, before the sort of mapping cone formula kind of was fully developed. That was uh, the way you could prove these types of things. I'm just wondering if that sort of persists here, too. Um, but turning it on its head and just getting information about the zero surgery as well. But anyway, just to. No, that's a good comment. Yeah, we didn't think so much about relating it to the zero surgery, but we did. I think that we did talk a thing about the correction terms, so that we can say something about that, um, which is, I think, morally what is similar to what you're saying. Um, I mean, so if you know the, you know, there's the, if you know the, um, yeah, if you know the local type, then you can always compute the correction terms of of surgery. So there's there's the d invariant from Oshvath and Zabo that has been around for quite a while. Um, and that's an invariant of homology coportism. Hendricks and Manolescu define two, vert, two sort of uh, perturbations of the D invariant, you might say, D upper and D lower, which are also invariants of homology coportism. And so what we showed um, is that if you, uh, if you look at D upper and D lower, they're computed by, I guess I haven't told you what V0 is, but Basically, for any surgery, you can compute them by knowing this concordance invariant V0. Uh, V0 up, or these V0 upper and V0 lower. Um, these are exactly the D upper and D lower of large surgery. They're the, they're, um, so basically it's saying that you can, oops, that's not what I wanted. Um, you can get the, the correction terms of any surgery by knowing the correction terms of, of uh, the, the sort of sub, of, uh, let's say the, a0 subcomplex of CFK infinity. Um, and then there's a correction term due to the lens space, which is just kind of a LN1, which is just a shift uh, that sort of a universal shift when you change the surgery coefficient. Um, similar, so we have that for the upper and lower of N surgery. And then also if you look at the half, if you do even surgery and you look at the sort of half spin C structure, um, N over two, I guess this way I'm doing two end surgery and doing looking at the end the spin C structure n. Um, then we kind of like we don't know anything. You, well, we don't get any relation to the d upper and d lower. Instead, what you get is just that it's d the d invariant of the surgery. Sorry, d lower of the surgery is the same as the d invariant in the surgery. Um, and D upper of the surgery is just the D invariant of the lens space, uh, L2 and one. Um, and so there's kind of, we, we think of this as like an analog of a result by Ni and Wu, 
uh, which concerns the ordinary D invariance of surgery. That kind of like um, the D invariants aren't very sensitive to the surgery coefficient, I guess you could say. They're basically all that, like if you look at the D invariants in different, for different surgery coefficients, they're all kind of all the same up to a sort of universal shift. Um, so that, that was kind of a corollary of this, of this, uh, of our work. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly touch on like how does, how one actually proves any of this. Um, what kind of goes into it. If you're an expert in the mapping cone formula, you might already have some ideas for what a proof would look like, but um, we'll kind of touch on this a little bit. Uh, so we recall the main steps in Oshvath and Zabo's proof of the ordinary mapping cone formula. Uh, there are two sort of two really important pieces that are basically get you all the way to the end. One is the large surgery formula, which is that if you do uh, N surgery, uh, if N is sufficiently large, then kind of the floor homology in the I spin C structure is just the homology of A sub I of the knot. So kind of this, you have the subcomplex of CFP infinity and you just take the homology of that. Um, the second piece is the surgery exec sequence, which is you have, for you, you have, uh, but you want the one that increments the surgery coefficient in, at, you know, M steps. So if you want to, uh, so there's HF minus Y and HF minus Y and M plus one. So we have kind of an increment by M. And the cost of incrementing by M is that you have to use twisted coefficients in one of the terms. Um, so for ordinary Hager floor homology, this just, the twisted piece is actually just a direct sum of copies of HF minus Y, just M copies of it. Um, so let's just kind of sketch. So, okay, how do we, so let's see, what do I want to say here? Um, the large surgeries formula for involute Hager floor homology was already proven by Hendricks and Manolescu. That was kind of in their first work they proved this. But the actual the surgery exact sequence is pretty is more challenge. Well, it was more involved for us to prove. I um, mean, it remained elusive. People kind of tried to prove it for a long time, or for a couple of years, I guess, but weren't able to prove it. And so that was kind of the remaining step challenge that had to be done before all the mapping cone formula was before we were able to do the mapping cone formula. It was proving an analog of this surgery exact sequence. So here's kind of a, an idea of how this goes. So we're going to consider the M equals one case. We're going to discuss how you might prove the mapping cone formula with in the M equals one case, just to simplify the notation. Then all the twisting goes away. We just have the ordinary FLIR groups. Um, the idea is basically is you kind of use this homological algebra trick. You want to define a first. Let's define a cobordism map from y n plus one CFI minus of y n plus one to CFI minus of y, and then we'll define a quasi isomorphism from y n to the cone of this cobordism map. That's kind of what what you want. Note that if you have a if we had such a such a construction. Um, there's already, there's just a long exact sequence for a mapping cone. Um, and kind of, if you had a quasi isomorphism, you know, you just use this, this, uh, mapping cone exact sequence, and that would give you exactly the long exact sequence that we're looking for. So kind of what we want to do is we want to define a cobordism map from Y n plus one to Y, as well as a quasi isomorphism from Y n to that mapping cone. So what is this, um, and then this just says exactly what I said. We just use the long exact sequence for a mapping cone. So what would such a map uh, and a quasi isomorphism look like? What would a cobordism map and a quasi isomorphism look like? Um, well, basically you're just looking for a big diagram that looks like this. So what you, what you actually end up doing, the kind of challenging step is you build what's called a hypercube of chain complexes. Um, which in this case is just, uh, you have a three-dimensional cube and at every vertex you have a chain complex. Um, and kind of in this picture, this doesn't look like a cube, but you imagine there's kind of a two, two places in the cube where the chain complex is zero. Uh, but we think of this as a cube and then we want to define maps in the cube and we want to think of them as having kind of a length. So for every uh, time we just increment one index, we want to get a chain map. Um, so that's the solid arrows. And then every time you increment two indices, you want to get uh, a homotopy between the two compositions on the face. 
Um, and so the dashed lines are kind of the length two maps, which are chain homotopies between the two ways of going around the face. So at the top, what does that mean? That means that you know, there's no, there's no, if we look at the top, there's no, this kind of missing uh, complex at the top. So that says exactly that you want the composition along the top, these, the composition of these two solid arrows to be null homotopic. And the homotopy, the null homotopy is exactly the map at the top. And so then there's kind of a length three relation, which you can think about. It's basically what you do is you take the sum over the four ways of taking a solid arrow and a dashed arrow. So you could go dashed on the top and then followed by this one here, uh, this iota here, or you could take this solid arrow followed by this dashed arrow. You could go down dashed arrow, solid arrow. Um, and then at the bottom, you could go iota and then this bottom dashed arrow. So there's four ways of compo making like, a, of composing a length one map and a length two map. And so you sum over all of those and you want that to be null homotopic. And the homotopy is exactly the length three map, the dotted arrow on the back. That's the null homotopy of it. So that's, we call this a hypercubic chain complexes. And the crux of the matter of defining this exact sequence is building such a cube like this. Um, and, and actually in this whole program, kind of all of these, um, if we think about it, like the maps along the top face, these are actually defined by Ogevoth and Zabo. This is, those are the maps they used in their original mapping cone formula. And then, um, and similarly, the maps along the bottom face are actually the same maps as on the top face. Um, and so those were built by Ogevoth and Zabo. And the maps on the front two faces, those were actually built by Hendricks and Manolescu, or at least they, I mean, we had to modify their construction a bit to get exactly what we needed. But morally, those were just the ones that Hendricks and Manolescu defined. And so the really challenging thing for our work is defining this length three map, this dotted arrow. That's kind of where a lot of the work went into. Um, and on, you know, we want a cube and there's one property which I mentioned, which we also want, is we want the maps along the top face to equal the maps along the bottom face. And the reason we do that is because we can, um, oh, here I meant, to, I kind of went out of order here. So yeah, just as I said, the maps along the top and the bottom were constructed by Ojvath and Zabo, maps on the left and front by Hendricks and Manolescu. Um, that's just what I said. Um, but the reason we want the maps along the top and the bottom to agree is that we can add the identity map to them. We can add, uh, and we still get a hypercube of chain complexes. And now I'm just gonna sort of formally add in the Q variables, and the Q, Qs, so it looks like an involutive complex. And, um, and now I've colored the complexes. So we have the one on the left is red and these two are blue. And such a diagram, if you just translate the definitions, it's exactly a chain map from sort of the, uh, the involutive floor homology of the end surgery to sort of the cone of some map um, from CFI minus Y N plus one to CFI minus Y. So kind of the crux of the whole matter is just building this um, sort of daunting cube of, uh, of chain complexes. And I think that's actually all I have to say. So thanks for listening. <laughs>